Okay, we're recording. Hey, hey everybody, welcome to the Story Studio podcast today. Um, this is, we're going to be doing one of our state of the industry um, series podcasts. And um, well, you'll see what that means as you go through these. Today, we're talking to Becca Syme and the way that um, she was introduced to us. I, I mean, not introduced to us, but I know that Sean and I, not sure if anybody else, um, but I know specifically Sean read Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. And um, so we're going to talk about sort of uh, what what would be the best way to describe this sort of like mental framing well, where your I strengths just... like leaning into your strengths. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Leaning into your strengths, um, knowing what advice you do and don't have to follow that's out there. Uh, I always think of us as being curators, like we're trying to help people make good decisions. All right. And, uh, and that's kind of our tagline is like, we don't want to make the decisions for you. We don't want to tell you what to do. We want to give you the tools to make good choices for yourself. So I really like this um, topic. It kind of reminds me of Seth Godin's The Dip, where he talks about what right. to quit is as, most, is as important as what you keep. And I think that a lot of people do, tend, especially when we're indies, we're sort of like, you know, one person shops. And so we're trying to do it all. And boy, is everything super important. And, um, you know, knowing what to focus on is a big deal. So, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, what a, one of my, uh, anybody who's been listening for a while knows that one of my good friends is named Seth and he's, I, I really like the way he thinks. And um, I, I knew that we would be friends for a long, long time <laughs> when we were having a conversation this is had he smoking his Hobbit pipe? Maybe seven or eight years ago. No, but it was when he was still smoking a Hobbit pipe. For those of you who don't know, Seth used to smoke a Hobbit pipe. I like that you said, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Seth, you, nobody's going to even know who Seth is, let alone that he used to All smoke right. a Oh, everybody's like, oh, come on, Sean. We already know this. I'm turning off this well, episode. Seth, <laughs> Seth used to smoke a Hobbit pipe. And at the time, we were talking. And um, I, I actually met him through a friend of mine. They, they used to build WordPress themes. Uh, the Catalyst theme. If anybody remembers that, uh, he and his his business partner Eric would build this this theme, and um, and I knew Eric, which is how I met Seth. But then I still know Seth, and I haven't talked to Eric in years and years and years. And when they when they broke up, I, I asked, you know, what was it about your partnership that didn't work? And because I really like Eric, it's not like you know they're and they're good people. I couldn't see them having some explosive disagreement. And he said, no, it was just a difference between the way that we approached coding and, and product. And, and I said, oh, well, what was the difference? And he said, well, every time we were done with a project and we were deciding whether or not to ship it, Eric's question would be, is there anything else I can add? And my question was always, is there anything else I can subtract? And they were totally different. And I like I hear Seth in my head all the time when I'm trying to make decisions. And is there something else I can add? You know, the better question might be, is there something else I can subtract? And to me, that's what your book does. It, it, it asks the authors to say, what can you subtract? And it's not something that enough people talk about. It's we feel this need to do everything because everyone can publish now. So everyone publishes now. That means they're doing the covers yeah. and the edits and all this obnoxious stuff and we need to be learning the right things. Just in time learning is a huge thing that we really need to be paying attention to. But even more importantly, which is what you really focus on is making sure you're doing the right things for the right reasons that you're wired to do. And yeah. I just really resonated with that message because it's what we've been doing for the last two years. You know, we kind of like dipped underground into production mode and started to really nurture all of our writers individually. And that's the thing, they're individuals. So there is no structure that works. There is no um, discipline that works. It, 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 like we're all creative people with creative brains. So we need to bring the clay to someone else to help us shape. And that's what you do professionally, which I think is fascinating. So tell us a little bit about that, because I know you've been helping people kind of unstick their shit for a long time. So yes. what, <laughs> what, is the, yeah. what is your origin story there? And then how did you get involved with all of the dysfunctional people in the author business? <laughs> well, the first time that I really realized this was necessary was sort of early on, like a lot of people got into indie publishing early and I came at it as an author. Um, who had a background in success coaching, like I used to do it professionally outside of writing, but then I was a fiction author and uh, had been coaching in a particular success program called the Clifton Strengths. 
Um, and people would come to me and they'd be like, I'm having this problem. I'm having this problem. And I'd be like, well, here's how success patterns work, right? Like everyone's different. Everyone has a different thing. And literally she was doing the exact opposite thing. Um, and it happened to be trying to write every day. And so that's the one that I've become the most oh, but isn't that the way for, that you become an author? That's you what I've heard. Right? Like I've heard that all successful authors, and if you can't see me, I'm doing very intentional air quotes <laughs> around all successful authors, uh, quote unquote, write every day. And so I said, hang on just a second, like, just try this for me. The next time you want to walk away from the computer to think, just walk away from the friggin' computer. Like, it's okay. And she needed the permission, right? So I was like, just walk away. And so there was a super complicated neurological, like neurobiological reason why I said that. But, but I was like, but you want to do it and it's how you know your best stories come and why won't you do it? And she literally said, I won't name the person, but she just come back from a conference and she was like, this guru said every successful author that he's ever known has written every single day. And I was like, he is lying to you. <laughs> Try to prove his point. And maybe it's true, but my guess is that he's never asked every single successful author no, how they're successful. it's an assumption because that's, that's the prism through it's which he sees the world. And I said, I have. Like, this is what I do because I'm curious about, you know, how patterns affect this. So I was like, just try it. Just experiment with this for me. The worst can happen is that you lose one day of productivity. So she walks away from the computer and literally the next day wrote more words than she'd written in the last six months. And I'm like, huh, you mean this isn't like rocket science to everybody else? It feels like it's not rocket science to me. It's like, it's, you're not getting the results that you want. Why are you continuing to do this? And the answer kept being because somebody told me I had to. And I'm like, but how do they know? Like, I know how these people make their speeches at conferences. They're talking about their own system and they're using statistics and metrics in a way that they shouldn't be to try to prove themselves. Right. And I'm like, I can promise you, I know how success patterns work they're not telling the truth. And most of it is unintentional. Most people are not trying to get them to do something that's bad for them. They literally don't know that this happens. They don't realize that when they give the talk at the conference and walk away, half of the people don't write for a year after they say you should write every day. And then people all of a sudden are like, and I stopped writing for a year and I heard story after story after story. So I just started a class that was like, okay, here's how this works. Like, let's go through your individual stuff and figure out why you're not getting the results that you want. Cause that's always why people were coming. Somebody told me that I would be successful if I did this and I'm not. And why? And I'm like, well, I can tell you why, but you know, you have to listen to me. So, so, so in, that's kind of how I got into it. How long ago was that? Uh, so 2015 was the first class that I taught. Uh, the first time I taught a class and I taught a class called Indie Insider. Um, and it was a very, like we always say, we have a concierge approach. We coach every single person who comes into the class. So like I've coached almost 5,000 people by this point, like individual That's incredible, authors. Rebecca. Yeah. That's really incredible. I mean, I obsessively do it. Right. Cause I'm like, got to prove the pattern, got to prove the pattern. Um, and so I started coaching uh, intentionally coaching one-on-one -on -one and doing classes with a one-on-one -on -one approach. And then I started teaching WBF, which is Write Better Faster. And that's the course that I teach now, which is almost the same course. Um, and uh, I think in 20, late 2016 was the first version of that class. And, uh, and we get, I coach upwards of a hundred new authors a month. So like, that's incredible. Yeah. So, it's okay, all so, that I do. <laughs> so that's a that's a that's a, a long period of time. Do you think yeah. that? Do you see uh, any trends? I mean, we're talking about the state of the industry. Do you see uh, it getting better? Do you see it getting worse? Do you see it getting static? And I know we have odd data now because we also have COVID, which I think really yeah. changed the temperature of it how did. we're all feeling and how we can produce. But um, 
I, I, so I guess that's two separate questions, but they're super related. So have yeah. you seen a change and what would it be? And then how has COVID impacted that? Totally seen a change, which I'm really happy about. Like when I first started saying this, I have this phrase, uh, QTP question the premise, right? It's like when somebody tells you something, you always want to question like, is that really accurate? And like somebody says, all authors write every day, question the premise, right? So when I first came out with that, I got so much pushback from people. It was insane. And then the more that I would say it, the more people are like, yeah, this works. And they'd see that it worked. So I feel like between that and other like sociological phenomenon, I'm seeing much more acceptance of this. Everybody's different. All success is different. Uh, which I'm so happy to see like it widely accepted. But the problem is that it's getting more and more panicky in the industry because, you know, what worked before doesn't work anymore. Or, you know, I had success for a year and now I'm not, or I've been trying to do this unsuccessfully for so long. Why am I not? And it's like the panic ratchets up a little bit every year. Do you feel um, like the faster people... the algorithms get? Do you feel like uh, that makes authors more competitive than they would otherwise be? So yeah. they feel like oh, yeah. maybe pettier and like, we all know that pettiness is just, it's not a cool emotion <laughs> and it doesn't lead yeah. you to your very best self. Right. Yeah. But I, but if you're, if you're not making money and you're putting everything into it and let's say, let's say you're somebody who puts craft first and you see some like real algorithmic churny stuff that they're publishing rough drafts and making how much, right. So it, it's that comparisonitis. I imagine that's a yeah. huge issue, right? It's huge. And we literally have, <laughs> we, we have a, um, uh, a whole lecture in the class that is just not everybody cares about what you care about. And here's the math about how that works. Scientifically, you don't, you, you are not like everyone. And that's why all of the I like that teacher. Scientifically, you are not like everyone. I would yes, wear the like, shit out of that. And I have the math to prove it. And I can show you. And also, um, and that's why. So, like, we have this conversation about all of you who think that the people who are writing crappy books shouldn't be making money need to settle down and be okay with it because you can't change it. So it's like, are you going to get mad at something you probably couldn't write change? that even if you wanted to. If you, you decided, like, you know what, I would really like people. to write some crappy books that, you yes. know, are in this genre that I don't care about. If you went to yes. do that, you'd be going upstream, right? Which yeah. is something else that you, I Yeah, we may have tried that as an experiment. You can't do it. And you can't do it, right? Yeah. Like, but, but this is also what I like about how far we've gotten into this process is that now more and more people are saying yeah, this didn't work for me, right? Like you'll hear the, I tried that and it didn't work and they're being public about it. So I'm super grateful also for the transparency because one of the hardest parts in the beginning was that there was no counterpoint voice. I was the only counterpoint voice and I can only be so loud because, you know, I'm also a fiction author, so I have something at stake. But um, so I had to be cautious about saying like, naming names or whatever, because it's not about the people who are teaching. It's about how we make choices as individuals and who we listen to and who we don't. Um, and I wanted to be really cautious about that because I don't want anybody who's teaching to stop teaching. They should all be doing exactly what they're doing. But the people who are listening should be filtering better. And yeah. so that's kind of where I wanted to come back around to then with when I wrote the book, right? Well, it's, it's like it's, just it's human question. nature, right? We look at other successful people and we try to deconstruct it, but we don't know what their yes. path was to get there, what their circumstances are right now, what support yes. system they have, or what their goals are, because yes. their goals might be completely different. So yep. we Well, we here's something criteria. that usually sort of twists people's head because they assume that successful people know why they're successful, <laughs> especially because they tell us why they're successful. Right. But most of them are both, well, well, first of all, they don't actually know why, like from a psychology of success perspective, they're not conscious of why, because most of their success is unconscious in terms of it's not coming from something that they consciously chose. It's like it's a confluence of events, right? It's how hard they worked, yes, but also how talented they are, how much time they have, when they got into the industry, what genre they started in, 
uh, how they, how interact they with deal other with people. failure. Some people talk about them, you know, what yes. is their reputation? Yeah, Johnny yep. and I at uh, the Austin Film Festival a couple of years ago, um, Craig Mazin was talking. Um, he wrote Chernobyl and Hangover, which <laughs> those two movies don't really go together, but there they you go. They don't go together. Um, and uh, he, he has the Script Notes podcast and with John August. And he was talking about story structure and uh, he used Finding Nemo as an example of this like perfectly constructed movie. But his message was everything has story structure when it's already done in, in, in the theater and you can go and deconstruct it and say, hey, here's the structure that this thing follows because you're plugging it into an existing map. And what you're saying yeah. about success is exactly the same. I was yeah. successful. Let me let me give that an autopsy, and then I'm going to give you the results. But th yeah. the results are there to filter through, making you yourself look good. Um, you know, really, we all have different criteria, and even if it's not making yourself look good, it's there's something there. There's something there that has informed your story. So. But also, there's other variables. So if somebody has been successful, even if you do the exact same things in the exact same way with almost identical timing and talent, like you are gonna be in slightly different situation because the algorithm is just slightly different. And it's like that um, Heraclitus quote, no man can step in the same river twice. In the same uh, river and twice. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so, so true. And that's why the blueprints don't work and, and things like that. So I'm wondering Becca then, if everyone is feeling panicky, then what's, what's the, an, an, antidote, an antidote to that? Like what um, advice would you give to the authors that are in this moment, feeling really stressed out, feeling like I missed the wave, it's nothing works anymore, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, I would say um, the first thing that we always try to do is to understand where they are and like validate it's, it's stressful right now because it's really important to have that moment of panic validated because then you're like, oh, I'm not the only one feeling this way. That's super important. So uh, that's sort of step one for me. And then the second step is to deconstruct why they individually are feeling that panic. Because like some people um, have accepted expectations about what success is supposed to look like that are not true for them. And then they just need to know, oh, I didn't realize I did that. So what's true for me? And then we help them find that. But the other piece that's sort of more general is that if you're not having success, it's probably not about you. Like it is probably not your fault. It's probably not that you're a bad writer. It's probably not that you're lazy. It's usually that you're trying to do something in a way that is against your system. Like, and, and the, the core concept of our program is that success is systemic, first of all. Like, so not just systemic to the, the whole industry, but also to you as a person, your life is a system. And so sometimes there's a piece of your system that is not aligned correctly. And so you're, you're not going to have success. Like if you're expecting yourself to write every day and you're not a person who can do that, then your expectations are causing you pain and we need to get rid of that because you're not going to have success expecting yourself to be like somebody else. Um, and so a lot of it is about, and, and this is why the book is uh, what to quit, what to keep and what to question, right? It's like, what are all the things that we need to generally quit doing in the industry? Uh, quit expecting that every book should sell, right? Not every book is going to sell. And so sometimes we see people who will glitch because they'll just try to keep advertising a book and advertising and promoting and finding different ways and recovering. And then you go and look at the book and it's like, no, nope, it just wasn't right. Like that's, that was an attempt make another attempt, right? And that this is how we talk about resilience as well. Um, Cause I feel like there's this, the FOMO leads to, I only have one chance to do this because if I don't do it right this time, I'm never gonna have another chance. And that kind of like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? There are tons of chances. There are tons of opportunities. This is not the only time I think uh, several people have said this before who are the big, you know, the big great thinkers in indie. Uh, this is just the beginning of oh, the we're indie still revolution. In the early adoption phase. It is crazy. Yes. Thank yeah, at, you. Our, at, at our oh first, my gosh. Uh, yeah, our, our very first uh, live event that we did, you know, 
and one of the last, because we'll never do that shit again. <laughs> but back when we did, um, uh, Chris Fox was was talking, and oh, it was the second one. It was the second one, and 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 Chris asked the audience how many people think that you know we're in the end days, and it was it was surprising, like. I think our audience is savvy about that kind of stuff and they should know that this is still the early adoption phase. And it was a lot of the room. It's just like, it's, it's ending. This is but a I lot mean, of people don't know the change adoption curve, right? Like most people don't know that. And, and so when you understand that it's like, Oh, and so when you explain it to them that all of a sudden they say, Oh, you mean this might be the beginning of the rest of my life instead of the end of the rest of my life. And then it's that switch. Right. And you can see their fear just go away. Like, Oh, like one of the most common questions we ask is like, well, how old are you? Right. Okay. Let's say I'm 50 years old. How many decades left of writing do you have? Let's just say conservatively four decades left of writing at 50 years old. Awesome. How many books could you potentially write in the next 40 years? Great. Let's say conservatively three books a year. That's a lot of books that you could potentially write in the rest of the years that you'll be alive. I guarantee you indie publishing is not going to be dead before you die. So write what you want, like do it how you want, write how you want. There's always going to be a chance to be the next big thing. a little like parenting. (laughs) Yes. Like I tell my son all the time, dude, don't think about what you don't have. Think about what you're going to get. Yes. (laughs) So, okay. That's that that's that perception switch, you know? So it sounds like instead of looking at the past and like looking at your own, your own success so far, it's about looking at the future, which I think is challenging as humans because we, we tend to, you know, think for, you know, think that our past will go forward ahead of us because we have no other experience to, um, to connect to that, you know, so then we have to look at other people and we go, okay, well, you know, Sean sold this many books, maybe I'll be able to sell that many books, but then you start doing the comparison and like, oh, but Sean wrote every day, you know, and, and so I can see how- And if I can't do that, why should I even- Then I'm going to fail. Yeah. 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 And then you just- Stop. Like I've absolutely had that had that happen because I'm a bachelor. I am not a consistent everyday person. Whatever my brain is on, it wants to be on that all day. And I will just do it all day. And then the next day I'll do something else. But trying to be consistent definitely has has been a challenge for me in the past. Yeah. It, it seems like there's three different things that are really hold authors back. So um, and tell me if I'm off here. And if so, if these three things seem like the three big ones, which one is the worst? So I think <laughs> the, the writing every day or the, let's call it writing every day because that's probably the biggest takeaway people get. I got to write every day, but it's really the bigger problem is adopting some, but looking for the magic formula, uh, yes. whether it's process or structure or whatever it is, I'm going to stumble upon the formula that tells me what to do instead of the formula is how I apply to the different elements, right? So mm-hmm. looking for a formula is one. The, um, the glass is half fullness, you know, like shit, the industry's over. I missed the gold rush, uh, yeah. which is number two. And then just absolute comparisonitis. Like you're not able to find your own voice because you're always worried about what everybody else is doing. So yeah. are those the big three and how would you, Say the ratio. Can I can I add a suffix to what you said about yeah, comparisonitis? Ahead. About um, I am not. Well, how did you say that last one, Sean? It was like, am I, you know, comparing myself to other people? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do relative to what they're saying? Whatever that was, it was yeah, the inverse. That's what it I said. Like, <laughs> well, it was it was the the inverse because I think there's a real tendency, even if nobody's telling you doing doing anything wrong, to look it's whatever the inverse was. You 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 notice it, and other people say it to you which I think it, it, one or the other can happen in either case you sort of, because I mean, I, I'm pretty confident, right? Like I'm pretty, I'm pretty much like, I know who I am and what I'm supposed to do. And it's still easy to feel when you're in a group, like, okay, well, I'm the only one doing it this way. Even though it's been working, I wonder if that's wrong somehow. Well, are the results? Yeah. Are you getting, you know, are you satisfied? Are you productive? Yes. Yes. But there still has to be something wrong because nobody else seems to be doing it this way. And everybody else says not to do it this way. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and that's exactly what, where I would have gone is I would have said big, super big picture. I would distill it down to there's a magic pill, Mm -hmm. right? 
there's a magic pill or a magic bullet or whatever the magic thing is, and I don't have it, but somebody else does, right? And so, like, that's, that's kind of the key for me. And I do feel, to a certain extent, like, everybody has their own version of looking for that. So, like, what Johnny mentioned is, is a super important version because a lot of people who are successful are not successful in the way that other people are. So they question it because it doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be a formula to it. So that falls under the category of assuming there is a formula that somehow I don't have. Uh, and, and, but I think that all of those things sort of fall under that, the big picture heading of there's a magic formula that I don't have and I need to go looking for it. And, and to be fair, we in the nonfiction industry don't do anyone any favors by saying, oh, by the way, there is a magic formula. And if you pay me $2.99, I'll tell you what it is. Not that, again, not that we shouldn't do that, but it's important to understand what that thinking does to the people who are reading the books is it reinforces the fact that there is in fact a magic formula out there. So I always appreciate when I read nonfiction and they say up front, like, this may not work for everybody or this may not apply to you. And so at least they're acknowledging at the beginning that they don't personally as an author think that. But the problem is not what the writer or the author or the industry thinks, it's what the reader or the consumer thinks. Because we all secretly think that there is a magic formula out there and that someone else, it, it's located somewhere that we it's need to cultural. find. It's cultural. We, we it's do. cultural. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's understandable, right? Because you see somebody who's wildly successful and you want to know how they got there. But the problem is that then we take how they got there and they try to replicate their process like they actually try to go step by step through what they did instead of looking under the skin at the bones, like how, how closely aligned is the success that Nora Roberts has to the person that Nora Roberts is. And I've never coached her, but I've seen and met and listened to her enough to know it's perfectly aligned. <laughs> when you listen to her give advice I hear her personality coming through and everything she does and the alignment to who she is is complete and she is not apologetic about it, right? But then the people who don't have her success who want it look at the advice she gives and how she sets up her day and the kind of person she is and they try to fit themselves into the Nora mold. It's out of context. Yeah, it's completely out of context and it's not it's not systemic enough, right? Like, it's just, it's not holistic enough, I guess, is another way to say so that. So what is the danger of, because um, you're really talking about ignoring your natural strengths and looking yes. for somebody else's natural strengths so that you can co-op them and say, yeah. hey, that, that worked for Nora. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that on and see how it works. So what is the danger of it? just ignoring what is naturally best for you? So it's assuming that it doesn't matter. That's the biggest problem. Assuming that personality and the difference between systems does not matter to success. That is the biggest problem because, so let me put it this way. In the, so the success pattern that I work with is called the Clifton Strengths Finder, Clifton Strengths Assessment. And at, when they created this test, what they did was, uh, Dr. Clifton, you know, decades and decades ago, looked at the most successful people in the world and said, there seems to be a pattern there about how they are uh, similarly successful, but also different from each other, right? Like different people in different industries who are at the tippy, tippy top, top 1% uh, were all equally successful, but totally different. And he thought, is there a way to predict how that success happens. So they did 2 million interviews with the best of the best in every, uh, in every industry looking for the patterns, the overlaps, and they realized that there was a pattern to it. And then it had to do with what were the strongest traits that you show? Like, what are your strengths, right? And so they created the pattern out of the data of the most successful people. So the reason this test is so crazy accurate is because of the breadth 
of the like the assessment study and then the specificity of what they were looking for with no prejudgment about what the pattern was. So they didn't come to it like some of the other psychometric tests of like, hey, there's four types of people. Let me create a test to test for those four types. They said, I want to look at the outcome that these people are getting and the wildly successful outcome. And I want to try to reconstruct from page one how they got there. And what he found was the biggest predictor was that what they expected of themselves perfectly aligned with how they were wired to be successful neurobiologically. And the systems that they'd set up around themselves to be successful also aligned with that, with their neurobiology. And so to me, when people assume that it's a process, like a 10 step process that makes people successful, First of all, I feel like they completely invalidate how hard successful people work to figure out what works for them and to stick to that. And then the second thing is they don't understand neurochemistry. They don't understand cemented pathways like cemented neural nets. They don't get it. And so then I'm like, okay, let's talk about why that's important because once you're cemented, there's very little that changes in those cemented pathways. There's a ton that's still plastic, right? But among the cemented pathways, there's really only the opportunity to refine those cemented pathways. And so when people don't understand that, they, they invalidate their own capacity for success because they're trying to replicate somebody else's external process. And that's not the answer, right? Like, Anyway, I clearly could preach about this for a while because I get so passionate about it, but yeah. But then if so, if finding or if using your own systems and working within your own systems and maybe taking some of the principles of what people are teaching you and then applying it to your own systems is a, a great answer for people, then how do they find their systems in the first place? How would someone approach looking at like, what are my cemented neural nets and, and how do I um, apply something to me? Because I think it is easy to copy. It's a little bit harder to say, um, ask yourself the questions that are going to help you figure out what your system is. Yeah, I would say um, success always leaves clues, right? So how you've been successful in the past has a lot to do with how you're going to be successful in the future. And so for sure, some of it is looking at your best successes and how you got there is really important. The other thing is take the test, like take, take the Clifton Strengths test. If you're listening to this, we will give you a free code so that the, co the payment isn't a barrier, um, but it's worth it to take the paid version because the free versions are not as accurate, but take the paid version. We'll give it to you on our website. Um, because that research that they did, that is the accurate part, that's the key, right? Is that the patterns are already there. You don't have to do the work to ask yourself the questions. They've already figured out how to do that. Assume that they're right, right? Because they've been validated and revalidated. But then look at yourself. Like if you have never been successful, for instance, at having a paper planner, this is one of the huge ones. If planners have never been successful for you in the past, there's almost zero chance that this year's new paper planner is going to magically make you more productive. There's basically no chance that that is going to happen. And if you've never been able to stick with a planner for a whole year, but you love planners, then maybe the purpose of the planner is not for you to stick with it for the whole year because that's not what you use it for. Because like, for instance, a lot of people use planners primarily for brain dumping and they don't actually use them for productivity. And they that feel is guilty good. about it, right? Instead of yeah. just embracing what it actually yep. is so that it could be a tool. Yep. Let it be what it is. Let it do what it does. So like, for instance, people who make to-do lists and don't execute them and then they feel guilty because like I have this huge list of stuff to do and I never executed it. And I'm like, yeah, because to-do lists don't make you more productive. It's the alignment of the personality that needs the to-do list and then the productivity tool of the to-do list. So for some people, 
making the to-do list helps them to prioritize innately and then they don't need it after that. Yeah, we were just so, talking about this in, in terms yeah. of storytelling where Johnny was saying a lot of times I'm leaving notes for myself as I'm writing and I've got to cover this and I've got to cover this and I built, you know, I'd seeded this with this character and I need to make sure I close that loop. And as I'm writing, I get down and I'm like, I don't need that shit. <laughs> Why'd I make that list? And it's because his brain already has taken care of that. So the exactly. act of writing the list, it, it's not that he's not fulfilling the things he set up. It's that his brain already knew what to do. I feel like a exactly. lot of this is um, almost a Puritan work ethic sort of a thing, because by definition, I mean, the title of your book is about quitting at books. And so um, the idea of quitting means doing less. And when we're doing less then things are easier there's this innate sense, at least with Westerners, where it's like, oh, something's wrong because it just yeah. got easier, more fun, less annoying, and I feel like I have more time maybe. And so yeah. I'm clearly doing something wrong. Yeah, and I feel lazy, right? Like somehow if I have more time or if I need to take a walk and think about my book in order to get the word sound that I'm being lazy, and then Becca comes along and is like, nope, that's work. Thinking is work stop shaming yourself, you know, like, because so much of what we've assimilated, like, here's an example. So the eight hour workday is one of the biggest QTP episodes. We have a podcast uh, called the quick cast and we do these QTP episodes where I'm like, planners are productive. Uh, let's question that premise. And then I go through and question the full premise, right? One of the most popular episodes that we did was about the eight hour workday because the eight hour workday was an invention of the industrial revolution that was created because people who have money needed to feel like they were paying people to get, you know, that they were getting the most out of their money. So they created an arbitrary 10 hour workday and then an eight hour workday to, to give an hour for money, like an, an exchange to make an exchange. It's arbitrary before the industrial revolution most of the work day, quote unquote, was by what job you had. So people were much more seasonal in the way that they approached their um, work. And so if you were a novelist, for instance, <laughs> you would work while you were writing the book and then you would stop and you would go think and walk in the park and, you know, move to the country and have experiences and then come back and write another novel, yeah, right? They didn't have rapid releases, Becca. So. Exactly, which is true. <laughs> That is true. But on, on some level, right, the eight hour workday is an arbitrary construction of people who needed to, tr to be able to trade money for time. And so when we as artists or just entrepreneurs, right, hold ourselves to the expectation that I should be behind my desk working for eight hours, Becca comes back and says, why? Who's watching? Who cares? Like if you can get, who's paying you for the hours you're spending behind your, uh, behind your desk, right? That is not being true to the reason that the eight hour workday was created. And so why are we holding ourselves to it? And so when we did this episode, people were just like, my mind is blown by this. And I'm like, it's cause you never questioned the premise of like what Johnny was saying, right? Like, the, the work ethic, the, the Puritan work ethic, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, why do we have that? Like, why are we shaming people into not sitting around and resting? Because idle hands are the devil's playthings was the most <laughs> common phrase used. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah. okay, like let's no, deconstruct some cultural, of this stuff. For sure. yep. it, it also occurs to me that it might feel lonely if you yeah. aren't following somebody else's lead. Because if, 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 what I'm do, if what I need to do to be successful is unique to me, then it means that I have fewer opportunities to go ask other people for advice to yeah. sort of commiserate or, you know, help another person as like an accountability per partner. Um, and you really are just kind of uniquely on your own and it feels a little fragile. Like, well, if I fail, okay, I guess I'm out of the race and everybody else keeps on going and there's nothing we can do to make that different. Yeah, and, I, and you bring up a super important point too, because there are actually, so one of the strengths is called competition. And the core of competition is actually comparison and specifically comparison for higher aptitude. So for instance, Michael Jordan, he's never taken the test that I know of, but I'm fairly certain after watching The Last Dance obsessively that he's a number one competition. 
because of his behavior, right? So I'm like, oh, but wait, but there's Michael Jordan or, you know, the chick from Cheer. If you've watched the Netflix documentary Cheer, she's got to be a number one competition where they watch the people who are around them who are high and they look for what they do and then they sacrifice and they push themselves and they strive because they want to reach that number one spot. And so there is also actually a strength that's called competition that makes you need to compare yourself to other people. So even QTP, even Becca, right? So like when I say stuff, part of the reason we don't talk about competition a lot is because it's number 32 out of 34 in a current. So only about 12% of the population has it. It's very uncommon. Um, which is good because there's only so many number one spots out right. there. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but but there is also that sense of if you are wired to be a generative comparison person, where you judge how hard you're working based on how you compare to other people, then an approach like this means it's more necessary to find the people that you can compare yourself to because you need it in order to be successful, right? I definitely have a big dose of that because if I'm like, if I don't see anything else to compare to all of my productivity drops, if I see someone else is doing really well, or if I'm in an actual, any form of competition, it's like, it's, it's actually more fun. I'm I'm like super happy. Whereas if I'm just working on my own, I'm like, okay, it feels like (laughs) drudgery then, you know? Yeah. That's really important too, because that that's one of the ways we tell people if you haven't taken the test yet, you'll be able to tell by how generative the activity is for you. If thinking is never productive, if you don't create words by going for walks, then it's definitely not something we should encourage you to do. If comparison is never productive for you, like with uh, Michael Jordan, you hear him talk about how other people's success makes him want to be better. He'll be like, if I saw somebody super great at this game, I'd go learn how to play that game so I could beat them because I wanted to dominate them. And I'm like, that's competition for days. Like just seeing the ability to compare themselves to someone drives them to be better. When comparison is stealing your capacity, it's not good for you. But like, it's possible that if competition is high for you, you should be comparing yourself all the time to ev- right? Like, especially to the top people. And that's why this, the knowing your system is important then because yeah. what might be helping me might be c- keeping someone else behind. That's, mm-hmm. that's really interesting. Well, I really want to know, Becca, what do you think comes next? Like, what would you like to see happen next in the indie industry? I mean, I would love to be not needed anymore. Like, I would literally love to just go back to writing fiction, because that's why I got into this in the first place. And I would like to see everyone figure out what their success patterns are and hold themselves to those and then continue to get better. Because that's the other piece. And I'm so glad that you went there, because this is the piece that I get really excited about. Uh, two of my strengths are significance and maximizer. And they're all about like taking people to the absolute tippy top of what they're capable of. And, uh, I'll, and I'll tell this story really quickly. One of the first validated studies about this positive psychology success pattern about strengths was about speed readers, which I think we all identify with where you had uh, two groups of, spe- of readers and the control group started off at, and I always get these numbers wrong and I'll come back and, and correct them later. But uh, they started off at 70 or 90, I can't remember. And then they, the control group was average. They started off average and ended average. So they started the low end and ended at 150 on the high end of average. But the higher group started off at the high end of average. So they no training whatever or whatsoever. And they were naturally gifted. And they ended at 3,000 words a minute. 3,000 words a minute. Like with one speed reading class, they both took the same class. One group got marginally better and was still average at the end. And the other group started off with a higher capacity and went to the top 1%. So like uh, 1,000 words a minute to 25,000 words a minute is the top 1% of of reading speeds. And so for me, the next step is, in order for Becca to be out of a job, please God, let that happen would be if everyone would find the place where they could hit the 3,000 words a minute level for themselves, the success for themselves, 
then it wouldn't matter anymore what I say because everybody would be expecting only what they can do and then maximizing the crap out of themselves to get to that top 1% place. And that's what I would like to see more of is less of the, uh, I'm worried that I won't have this, you know, why am I not being successful? And more of the, here's exactly what I know I'm good at. And then how do I get to that tippy top of the, of what I can expect from myself? Yeah, that's a really fantastic answer. And you set me up perfectly for the, the yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I know your strengths. Um, yeah. For the, the, the last question, I, I mean, I could, I can, I could talk for days, but I do have one more yeah, question yeah. that I, I really do want to ask. And it's everything is a spectrum, right? And yeah. um, in our studio, I would say like Dave is all the way over here on, on one end of the spectrum. I've worked with him for um, 11 years now. And wow. in the entire time I've worked with him, like it's always the same patterns. And we as a company now are trying to pull him out of some of those patterns and we see it. But even now he can't be on for this podcast because he's sleeping, right? We, we recorded a podcast earlier at noon and Dave can't do both. Yeah, for those of you who missed that, the window of noon to 4 p.m., it's hard to have that entirely awake. Like that's, I mean, for a normal person, noon to 4 p.m., you're sleeping on one end of that, it's usually both. Right, so Neve made this beautiful calendar <laughs> um, for like all the podcasts that we were going to have and, you know, uh, we're doing, we're doubling up. We're, we're creating this whole season and doing this thing. And, and Dave says, well, I can't do, you can't have me on at 12 and at three, <laughs> which is just, I mean, hilarious. I can actually relate if you change the times to like 12 to 4 AM like that, then I'm yes. like, Oh, okay. I get that. Either I stay up later. I get up early. One of the two. Yep. So, so that's, that's Dave and, and we have seen, and it's, it's, it's hilarious because he will do the same thing over and over and over. Like so many times I didn't want to keep piping in and go, well, you're describing Dave, but like the new journal each year, that's going to work all of a sudden. He, he will buy the new journal and he'll like this new journal, this new system. How do you think his Nutribullet's working out? Right. He's got the <laughs> unbox Nutribullet. He's got the treadmill with the clothes, you know, over it. So that's all the way kind of on, on this end. And then on, on, you know, the other end, like I'm, I'm pretty, I got my shit together. Like I, I write a lot. I, I run a business. I help everybody in the company in one way or another, but still, when I read your book, I was like, Oh, I need to hire her. Like <laughs> I need to, I need to optimize because we can always optimize. So on that yep. spectrum, how important is it to get this shit? Like, should we as a company just hire you for Dave? <laughs> and like, <fix> Dave <laughs> because we need to do that. Like, how important is it to self care and keep your self optimized all the way at the end? Like, if I'm already okay, so what you said about speed reading makes a lot of sense. I'm already, you know, I'm already speed reading, but I want to get to 3000 words a minute. That would yeah. be amazing. So yeah. Is that worth it? Or is the fact that I already have my shit together, it's much more important for someone like Dave to just get those fundamentals in place. What is that? Oh no, it's worth it. Like it's worth it for everybody. And I would actually say like, just because I, and again, I make some assumptions based on how you guys described him about what his strengths might be. And I would say, I would assume that every strong pattern comes from a strength behavior. So like, for instance, that. with what we would want to ask about Dave's system, for instance, and he, he could represent a million people, right? Because <laughs> there's so many people like him. But what, what you'd want to ask is, am I getting a level of excellence of something that comes from him being wired that way? And if I am, then I want to compensate for him and allow him to be that way because I want to let him be how he would be and not expect him to conform to a different pattern, right? And then, of course, the differences as a company, you have to figure out like when are our work hours and, you know, that kind of stuff. And that that's reasonable. But what I find often for people who are like you've said batching, for instance, or, you know, people who tend to kind of be night owls or who tend to um, binge write where they fall outside of the norm of what like Western society would consider to be productive, but they often offer something that is so worth letting them be that way, that it's better to let them be that way and try to maximize them how they are instead of trying to get them to conform 
down to a different pattern, right? So that's the one question about like that one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I would say it is always worth trying to get to 3000 yeah. words a minute, like literally always. I mean, th so just as a, for instance, the one client that I often use as an example, and I won't share her name because I think she would be mortified if I told you guys this, but like specific, she had very specific goals when she came in to write better faster. And she was making about $913 a, a year on her books when she came in. And now she makes that in a day specifically because the way that she changed her system to work, like she needed long periods of focus where her children were being taken care of by other people. So she could just put the blinders on and, and she needed to be able to have that. And, and it just wasn't something she ever felt like she could ask for. Right. Cause she's like, well, you know, the whole family loves I'm each other. We're super close. Yeah. And like, I feel some responsibility and whatever. And then she was like, okay, work days, even in summer, right? Like I don't bother me between eight and five. I'm in the office writing and it, and she has a strength called focus where they excel at putting the blinders on. So every time she got interrupted, it would literally take her two hours to get back to where she was. So it wasn't at all about, I don't love my kids or any of that. It was literally, if you give me four hours with the blinders on, that's all I need. Where it would take me 12 hours with constant interruptions before and I would not be able to get all the work done I wanted to. And now if I put the blinders on, I can get that work done. And the level she's gotten to now, which like three years later of development is just, it's insane to watch how fast you level up. We call it exponential development as you get better at what you're already good at. Um, and we have this idea that we need to get better at our weaknesses. Like somehow we need to just find all of our weaknesses and fix them and then we'll be perfect. And I'm like, no, you'll be average. Yeah. If you fix all of your weaknesses, you would be average. And we don't want average. We want excellent. Again, maximize your significance. So I'm like, yeah. fuck average. And so we don't want to look at the weaknesses. We want to look at the strengths. And if you maximize your strengths, not only does it actually compensate for the weaknesses, but it also makes some of the areas that you're just not gifted in irrelevant. Um, and so 3000 words a minute, every time I would vote for it every time with everybody. That's amazing. So, I have one burning question I have to throw out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you have, you work with a lot of writers and I'm really wanting to know, do they need the most help in terms, or the, do, do they need the most adjustments around their writing or around their marketing in order to break Ooh. through to the success? Which system tends to, to need more focus? That's such a good question. And, and I hate to say, so on my podcast, we have a drinking game for the, when Becca says it depends, um, <laughs> everybody takes a drink it's because true, Becca though. says you're, that you're, all yeah. the time. Honest, she says it all the time. Want. But um, so everybody drink because Becca's going to say it depends. But when I say it, though, it, it does depend more on their personality than it does on their, uh, let's say their system, right? Because so most of the time, people who have high executing strengths, uh, where they're getting a lot of stuff done, they're able to check stuff off the boxes, like they are more likely to have more of their more of an easy time right with the marketing tasks that form uh, because execution uh, marketing is a lot about execution right and so we don't tend to see a lot of tweaking of marketing systems uh, where I have to tweak a lot of marketing systems is often in either people with the high thinking strengths um, so the people who need a lot of process time who are more uh, who, who need to think about what they write. And then also some of the relating strengths where uh, they don't naturally like social media and they don't naturally like promotion. Yeah. So they have a hard time figuring out how to tweak their promotion schedule or their marketing so that it feels okay to them. It doesn't feel icky. Um, and so that's, that's kind of that pattern. Um, and a lot of what happens in text, like inside the actual writing, that's more often to do with things like um, the thinking strengths and the influencing strengths. And those are the four domains um, because an awful lot of people with high thinking strengths have been training themselves to fast draft. 
and training themselves not to think when they write or not to edit as they go. Those are the three big uh, things that I question the premise of in uh, those two books, the green one and the blue one, um, where I talk about how fallow fields is such an important thing for people who have a lot of thinking strengths. They literally need to replenish the nutrients in their brain in order to be able to produce a new thing out of it again. And that when you have fallow fields, the worst thing you can do for yourself is set an, a, pr a production schedule where you expect fast drafting and very quick turnarounds between finishing editing and starting a new book. Um, and so it, it, it kind of falls into broad categories, but those are the things we see the most often. That and please don't... Uh, look at your phone first thing in the morning <laughs> like oh that's God. the yeah. yeah that's the number one if if i were to say what's the number one thing that people do after write better faster to get more words done it's literally to stop reaching the phone so we make people put the phone in the other room and then we and then open the manuscript first not everybody writes first not everybody writes right away but just to get the book in your head, if you're a thinker, and then if you can write to write before you do the distracting stuff. Well, the phone and, is just putting the outside world into your internal world. And that's just, yes. that's, that's never, ever, ever been a good idea for anybody making something. <laughs> well, and the strengths that there are some strengths that are particularly susceptible to like losing time. So the person who's like, I'm just going to check Facebook real quick. And then four hours later realizes that they've been on Facebook for four yeah. hours that's the kind of thing for me that's like, okay, when I hear that, I know exactly where we're going to send that person, you know, don't check, put your phone in the other room and don't check it. And we get a lot of pushback and I'm like, just try it, just experiment, see what happens. Because the worst thing that could happen is you literally miss out on two hours worth of being stressed out. I think you're going to be fine, honey. Like, um, anyway. so I I know that we're over time and I know we need to go, but I, there's a question I need to ask. I feel duty bound because I could feel people driving into figurative walls if I don't ask this. Yeah. So, um, so we're, a lot of what we've talked about could be read as sort of lean into who you are, be less resistant, be more resistant to people saying to change who you are. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but you know what I mean? Like sink into, into who you are. So the, our Dave examples were um, centered around you know, letting him have a weird schedule or something like that. So here's my question. A lot of people are doing things that aren't working. And um, that same advice, if without, with a missing piece could be interpreted as just keep doing what you're doing, do what feels good. You know what I mean? Down that slippery right. slope. And so yeah. how do you obviously just do what feels good is not going to be something that works. So where, no, where is Facebook the line there? feels real good and that's <laughs> awful. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Because not everybody, I assume, is going to innately succeed at a given thing being exactly who they are without some sort of modification. So I'm assuming there's yeah. an adjustment that needs to happen there. Yeah, I mean, I would say perspective is the most important piece. Like one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest, I guess, questions that I always ask people is like, why did you assume that that was true? Right. And, and all it takes is that second of recognizing, wait, I never accepted that. I don't actually like that. Um, and so questioning uh, from someone outside, it doesn't even have to be us, right? It could be your friends. It could be anybody about what is it that I'm getting resistance to and, and why am I accepting it? And is it possible that there are other people out there who are successful in other ways? So that's one question to ask, but I do think that, um, you're really right in the sense of it's often not just what feels good, it's what works, right? So if I have never been getting results from writing every day and my innate instinct is that I shouldn't be writing words every day, then I need to at least try to do something different. If my innate instinct is to edit as I go, there's a reason why that happens and I need to at least try it. And then where you find the boundaries is like, for instance, with um, writing every day, I do still think it's important to have manuscript time, 
for those like intellection input ideation people who are the thinkers who may not write every day you if you're not writing you still need to be working right in terms of this is an excuse it isn't an excuse to just not work um but in order for you to make forward progress, sometimes you have to do things that don't look like work. And so typically what I say is to just question the premise. So if you start playing video games for a day in between your books and you get better, then that is exactly what you should be doing. I mean, in reality, I would say go take the test and then watch the videos that correspond to your top five because we do some of that work for you right? Where we say, we've coached enough people, we've seen the patterns, here's what tends to work for these different people. And so we're trying to give you that guidance of like, and then you can go off on your merry way and never talk to us again. That'd be great. Uh, not that we don't like you. It's just, there's a lot of people out there. And so I would say the guidelines are very important. The goal is still to help you get more done, like to write better, faster, right? But often the way that you want to do it is more of an indicator of what you should be doing and less and, and and that the resistance is sometimes actually what you shouldn't be doing right um and so for me it's always the forward motion if you're not making forward motion then you need to question the premise um and then and like i said i would use the information we've already uh, put out as a guide so what i'm hearing in summary is listen to your instincts and learn to trust them rather than the very loud external voice. But while you're yes. doing that, pay attention and have acuity to whether or not you're moving forward or not. Exactly. Yes. And, exactly. and take a strengths test. Yes. Cause forward motion is always the goal, but sometimes forward motion is, doesn't look like we think that it should, it might be calling a friend and, verbal processing, it might be taking a walk, it might be playing a video game, or it might be watching the, you know, online, uh, what is it, the uh, Kindle, uh, what is the name of the keyboards, right? Oh, no. Where oh, that's everybody's a reporting place. their sales no. or whatever, and you're like, <laughs> yes, I need more sales, and you're a competition, and you want to go compare yourself to everybody, then do that. But because also competition, people get told you shouldn't be so competitive. You know, it's bad for you to compare yourself to other people. And so every single personality has something that they've been told they shouldn't do because it doesn't fit the norm. And so they're self-conscious about it. And that's why I say it is a lot of instinct in, but I want to be competitive, but I want to think, but I want to relate, um, that kind of thing. So a lot of it is absolutely instinct, but I do want to, underline the forward progress like it should always come with forward motion all right so before i i, I do have a wrap up but um before we we close out i you're probably sick of hearing bonnie like she's just she she has a hard time mm -hmm. not talking she's just always yeah. she's a ball hog and she's sorry she'll apologize later but bonnie, oh yeah bonnie's she, here <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie, um, I know you're fascinated in all of this stuff. And just for a little bit of background, Bonnie is very good at this optimizing stuff, but she does it in a really specific way. So like she and I are writing a lot right now and she's been optimizing our, our outlines. So when I'm writing those drafts, she's really trying hard to get, she's never giving me a beat that I'm not super equipped to write to. She's figuring out nice. what my strengths are as a storyteller so that I have these kind of bespoke outlines that really lean into my strengths. So I know that Bonnie's super like interested in this on a macro level, and I'm sure she has questions that she has not asked. So before I close down, I feel like, Bonnie, what, what are you thinking here? No pressure, Bonnie. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you're right, Sean. Like, I am so fascinated by this. And like, as I'm listening to everything you're saying, Becca, I'm thinking, I can see there's a split in terms of how I deal with craft versus process. Because yeah. Sean's right, I do a lot of the things you're talking about when it comes to craft, and I am so terrible at doing it, applying it to myself. <laughs> like I can apply it to my craft, but like in terms of like my process and my habits, I'm a binge writer who's been trying to write consistently every day. And I've started probably a thousand streaks that lasted three days. <laughs> and I have half a dozen paper planners that have like the first one filled in. 
<laughs> yeah. Like you're literally <laughs> describing me as you're going yeah. through like all these different things people do. Um, and I have that same Puritan work ethic that Johnny, that you mentioned, it's just like that if you're not working eight hours every day or 10 hours every day, what the fuck are you doing? Oh my God. <laughs> Bonnie drops off. Sometimes like I'm waiting on a, an edit and I'm, I'm waking up at five 30 and I'm two hours ahead of her and she's dropping it off. She's like, good morning, Sean. I'm like, go the fuck to bed. <laughs> she was on something at eight, my eight in the morning, which, you know, is the middle of the night for her as well. Like, and, oh, wow. and on, <laughs> um yeah and i am i am really driven and i'm very much like if i could work for 24 hours and not sleep and get this done and then sleep for a day and just have that time off to to just process everything before i move on to the next thing i've like really struggled with how you move things forward consistently without taking those breaks and i'm just listening to everything you're saying and thinking oh my god like i'm doing everything wrong <laughs> Um, but I'm actually curious for you in, um, in terms of, um, in terms of resistance, when you see people going through this program and you start exposing to, to them, to these ideas and challenging their assumptions, what are the, what are the ways that their resistance manifests? Like, what do you see, um, when they're first getting exposed to it and how do you, what happens when you see them making the leap and they actually start? start making that transition to, to doing something that actually is in their strengths. Yeah, I mean, thankfully a lot of, almost all of our uh, uh, people who take our classes are referrals. So almost everyone has heard like, just go take this class and, and then, so they kind of know it's gonna be a little crazy and just go with it, right? <laughs> like just close your eyes and think of England kind of. And so they do know what to expect a little bit and that helps a lot because the expectations have been set that it's gonna not be easy to hear some of this stuff. But one of the things that I do is I always start with the bad news just so people know up front, like this isn't 10 tips and tricks. You're, it's not gonna be easy and simple. And I think when I set those expectations for people, they're like, oh geez, I thought it was gonna be so easy and they kind of freak out for a second and then they're like, and I say at the end, but you already know that this is not easy because you've been having so much resistance and that laughter of like recognizing themselves in that phrase is almost like it takes the walls down a little bit because, and I say this in, in the quit book too, like, you know, subconsciously that this is a hard industry and that it doesn't make sense and that success is really difficult and yet subconsciously you're expecting that to happen and those two things are not like each other. You have to let go of one of them or you're gonna constantly be frustrated. And I think once people recognize that like, there's a way to not be frustrated with this, like then they kind of get excited about listening to the hard stuff, which I appreciate. Um, but I do think it helps that we're able to say things that I know they've said to themselves right and so that resonance for them is is really helpful in breaking some of those barriers down um and then on being honest about like we've seen this like we've seen it happen so much and even if it's hard to hear wouldn't you rather hear the truth than hear something that again doesn't work for you um and usually they're like yes please and then you know, they'll listen to Becca say like, all right, stop using your phone in the morning. And they all freak out. And they're like, I don't know what that would be like. And I'm like, that's the addiction talking. Yeah, Just see, let it go. Paying somebody for their insight or advice. And then yeah, like yeah. questioning or like, just that's what you're here for. Don't but there's so much resistance, say, right? I don't like I don't like chicken breast. <laughs> like, yeah. So just no. <laughs> so okay. Yeah. Um, so just going back for, to what Johnny said just a few minutes uh, ago and like using Dave as an example, which is, he is our favorite example here, so it makes sense. Um, but with him, because something you said that I absolutely agree with, but I didn't want to interrupt you to kind of go sideways on it is, yeah, some people are, you know, what, they, what you get from them is so significant that you make allowances for them. And it's so, yeah. yeah, that's been, <clears throat> that, that, we've had separate rules for Dave forever. Yeah. And, you know, like if he was- That's really wise, by the way. It, well, it, it, it makes sense. It, it, it really does. 
But with, with Dave, I'm never trying to, um, I'm never trying to make him conform to something that isn't him. In fact, like, I think one of the things that, like, I'm curious what my strength finder thing would be because I, I'm super collaborative. I can work with very different people and figure out what's best for them. And I never have asked Dave to conform. What I do ask Dave very consistently to do and, and kind of what I want to round this out is to be aware of the stories that he tells himself. Because I think that, that I, all of us don't, we don't tell ourselves the right story sometimes. And we get very locked into a narrative that supports our behavior. And that's what I see Dave doing a lot is um, I feel comfortable with this story because it, it, it gives me a, a scaffolding, a reason or whatever, a, an excuse. And I think that we, that's what the magic bullet is. We're all looking for a magic bullet. Tell yourself the honest story, right? No one else's formula is going to work for you. And that's the caution I would have about anything like strength finders. It's really powerful, but you're also not, don't use that as your formula. Like, oh, now this describes me and now I don't really need to um, think around it. It's, it's a, it, it's some essential elements so that you can start to understand yourself better, recognize your patterns and start telling yourself a more honest story. So I think that's the main takeaway you want from this kind of information is, oh, now I understand myself a little bit better. Now I can um, make better decisions. Right. And specifically as it applies to success, like I would say strengths doesn't explain everything, right? Like people are always trying to ask like, well, is this why my husband or wife does X, Y, or Z? And I'm like, that doesn't sound like a strength behavior. I'm just going to say that's not a success pattern. So we don't cover that. Like so I, I'm not a therapist. it doesn't explain how to um, load the dishwasher correctly or incorrectly. No, like, okay. but it does sometimes explain why you don't agree about how to load the dishwasher correctly but it definitely is not meant to explain everything. But I will say part of what I love about strengths is that it's so complex that it's literally meant to not be prescriptive. Like it's meant to say, you are such a complicated person and your success is very granular and very targeted. And here's where the target is. Like here's how to hold yourself accountable to it. And then when you know how to, what to expect from yourself and how to get where you want to go, then there becomes no reason not to do that other than resistance. Right. And, and I do have to be honest and Bonnie's question was fair, right? Like there is still going to be resistance. And so how do you overcome that? Because even when you tell, like when I would tell someone don't be, yes, cookies help, (laughs) but like, don't reach for your phone and they have that immediate resistance like that's still going to happen even when you know your strengths because there still are old patterns that are comfortable and and so in that way i completely agree but but we definitely don't comp like we don't explain everything so there are other ways to explain uh things that don't apply to success but as far as success goes i feel like the the expectations that you hold of yourself are the most important part. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, um, Becca Syme is the author of Dear Author, You Need to Quit and other books in the Quitting series. Uh, I don't know that that's formally the name. Is there a formal name? <laughs> the Quit Books. The, yeah. The Quit Books. Okay. So that was close enough. And um, uh, her podcast is thequitcast.com, thequitcast.com. And the last thing I wanted to ask about, because I actually, you didn't mention this up front and you mentioned it during and I'm like, you know, lighten up. Um, you mentioned something about free codes for the Clifton test. Is that a thing? Yes. Yeah. And if you actually go to that website, thequitcast.com, it says at the top and we'll, we'll change it because the last one was uh, the SPF podcast, I think, but uh, we'll change it to say, if you come here from any of the podcasts that we've been on, we'll give you a free code, click here. Um, and so, and I can actually send them to Sean for, for all of you guys, but uh, anyone who's coming to click to the podcast, uh, to the quickcast.com, there's a link that says click here to get a free code. And if you click there, we will send you one via email. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's very, very cool. Cause I'm like, I want to take this test. No, I'm hearing all yeah. that. <laughs> all right. So thank you for being on. This is wonderful. Um, stay tuned for those of you out there in podcast land, I guess, for more of our state of the industry 
uh, series and good stuff. So thanks again. And thanks to all of you for listening and we'll see you next time. Adios.